Lord, we thank you for this day of giving us. Lord, thank you for getting us all here safely and to study your word. Lord, we ask you to be with John as he gets up here to teach us your word. And you're something to pray. Okay. Good morning. It's on? It's on. We are going to start in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 7. <clears throat> Excuse me. We are, uh, as we get closer and closer to the end, it seems like we're going a little faster to me. I don't know if that anybody else kind of gets that, uh, that impression, but uh, we'll be wrapping things up fairly quickly. Except the gospel meeting is going to get in the way, which is fine. Uh, so next week we'll probably end up in chapter 11. Uh, finishing up chapter 11, maybe getting into 12, and then the week after that, so two weeks from now, we'll be finishing up our gospel meeting, and then so early April, maybe the first week or two of April, then we'll finish up 2 Corinthians and probably go into Philippians at that point, so, um, but faster and faster, here we go. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, let me read verses 7 through 12. Let's see. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. We said last week as we got into chapter 10 that uh, the, the tone changes here. And he starts off in chapter 10, verse 1, he says, Now I, Paul, he would started the book with Paul and Timothy. Paul and Timothy are brothers. But now this last section, it, he says, you know, this is, hey, this is coming from me. Timothy's not responsible for this, I, I think is kind of what he's saying. Because he, he gets in here and he's going to hammer some people, I think, pretty hard. And uh, I don't think he wants uh, Timothy to take the, br the brunt of that. He's getting ready to go back and, and, and visit them. But Timothy's going to carry this letter in all likelihood. So, uh, but he's going to, uh, he's going to be very direct with them concerning his authority and uh, and he's going to directly reason with them so that they figure out why it is that he's got this authority and there are those there that are uh, claiming to belong to Christ that are leading them astray if they are there claiming that they belong to Christ and Paul does not he's going to put a stop to that he says no that's not the way it's going to be anybody that says there that must also recognize my authority under Christ. Um, now, those other people could be wrong, and they are wrong. Paul could also be wrong. Okay, the, the opportunity exists for both of those to be wrong. The difference is, is that Paul was chosen by God and has the signs of an apostle behind him to prove it. Okay, that's that's the distinction right there. These other people that have that have come there and that are disturbing things do not have the authority, the signs of an apostle that can prove that they are, uh, that they can say the things that they can they can say. And the, and the real problem here is that 
those people are dragging the Corinthians away from the truth. And we're going to make that point several times here. In fact, as we go through this, um, I, I think Paul approaches the problem here from a bunch of different perspectives. And I, as, I, as I go through this, it seems like to me I'm making the same point over and over again, just with different, different direction that he's getting to, because he's getting to the same point over and over again. And he's doing it, um, you know, kind of attacking the argument from all sides so that it can be very clear to them that he's got the authority uh, that they need to recognize. Okay. But then he goes on, uh, so which of them belongs to Christ? One or both could be wrong. Paul had the signs of an apostle. The point of having the authority is what? what well, how, does, how is Paul trying to use his authority? What's he trying to accomplish here? Build them up. Okay, he's trying to build them up, not tear them down. And he's not ashamed that he's got this, that the authority has been given to him to accomplish that. Now, sometimes to build somebody up, you have to tear them down a little bit first to get them to understand the position that they're in, that they are in, and the position that they need to be in. Okay, and so that's what, so there is a little bit of tearing down here going on, but, but the point of it is, is to build them back up. So, is Paul, who, who's undermining whom here? They're undermining Paul. Okay. How does he, how is he going to end up going about to understand who's got the proper authority? The proper authority. Paul's going to end up undermining them. He's going to do that by using the techniques that we kind of talked about last week and that are mentioned just above this in the first part of Tim. The tools he uses are reason to destroy arguments and lofty opinions, knowledge of God, self-control, and punishing the disobedient. We mentioned all those last week. Those are the tools he's going to use to do it, and those are legitimate tools to be using to accomplish what he's got to do. The problem is that they have been using, his detractors have been using false reasoning to accomplish what they want to accomplish, to undermine him. He's going to use proper reason. They, they do not know what they are talking about, okay? Because they're, they're spreading things that aren't true. Yeah. Do you see any uh, application to folks nowadays who say, uh, if Jesus didn't say it, then... Uh, yeah, it, I, I think so. Um, it, it's almost a self-obvious thing to me. But... You say those dumb questions. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but it, it is a dumb way to approach the Gospels, isn't it? And, and that's the thing. Is if you don't understand what uh, what Lee's saying there, there are people out there, look, Jesus didn't actually say that. Therefore, homosexuality is perfectly okay. okay. Because Jesus never condemned it. And, and you can go down a whole list of things that people, that you see churches um, letting into their brotherhood they just that are things of error and they're doing it I said, well jesus never taught directly on that well if you accept that then if you accept that line of reasoning then every kind of um, teaching false teaching is acceptable because you'll eventually get around to dismissing everything that's taught yeah, it's just as uh i can't remember what it was uh i think it was in romans where paul was gives his opinion instead of giving um, something that he was told to uh, yeah, yeah. Paul's still using his authority and his wisdom in applying that thing. Right. So we should still take heed as just as much as if right. was coming from He does that in the realm of marriage yep. is what comes to mind right away. But you know at the end of uh, at the end of I think it's in John before Jesus dead he says you know there's a lot of things you need to learn that you're not ready to be taught. But after I'm gone, I will send the Holy Spirit. Okay? And he will direct you into all these things so that, okay, well, the rest of the New Testament is the direction into all those things. So it has the endorsement of Jesus behind it. So when somebody says, well, Jesus didn't say it. No, Jesus told this, you say it. <laughs> okay? So the authority is still there. 
But it's, it's uh, you know, sorry, but it's John 3.19, isn't it? Men prefer darkness, and so they'll do whatever they can to dismiss any of the teaching in the Bible because they want to do other things. So, okay. Uh, so, they are undermining Paul and falsely doing that. They, they, they have no legitimate claim or ability to do that. Paul is going to turn it back on them and undermine them, and he has the legitimate authority behind him to, to do that. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about the nature of Paul's letters. He mentioned some things in here. He says, uh, he's kind of quoting what these others are saying about him. He says, for they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. What are the nature of Paul's letters? And go back to verse 2. I beg of you that when I'm present, I may have to show boldness with what su with such confidence as I count on showing against someone who would suspect us of walking according to the flesh. So he's he really, really bold if I have to. My letters are really bold. So his letters are pretty forceful at times when they need to be. You know, the first part of 2 Corinthians here is pretty encouraging, isn't it? Then he goes to chapters 8 and 9. And now he gets into this. And he's, okay. Said some nice things, but I, I need to hammer you. Some of you, not all of you. But there were people there who were leading others astray, and there were some who were being led astray. He has to deal with both of those groups, doesn't he? And so that's what he's doing here. Um, and he's he's really really hard on the ones that are doing the leading, the ones that are being led astray. I think he appeals to them in a softer manner. You can see it, see it in there, I think. And, uh, and so they're going to, hopefully they would both end up responding in the same way. Okay. But it, it's going to take a little bit different approach, I think, to get both groups, both groups there. And he's willing to lose the one group if he has to. Right. The ones that are leading others astray, I think he's willing to lose them if he has to, you know, save the others that are being led. Um, so his letters are forceful. They're written from the perspective of someone who is speaking with authority. Right? He's got the legit right to say what he is saying. And, but these things are not matched by his physical presence or his speaking ability that they have seen anyway. Okay. In speaking to the Corinthians, he has not been really bold in presence. He's not been really bold in his speaking manner. Later on, who does Paul stand in front of? Felix, Festus, King, Agrippa, stands in front of all three of those. Does he hold anything back then? He's properly polite, but he, he's very forceful. And you don't get the sense that he's a shirking violet when he's in that pulpit, do you? Okay. He tells the king, hey, you know these things. In a sense, he's politely scolding the king. You know, you, you know what's going on here. So Paul has Paul has an ability to, uh, to say what he needs to say without shrinking back from it. And speaking to them in their presence as very, very new converts, he's taking on a little bit different persona. Okay. okay. And then there at the end, in verse 11, let me read that again. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we will do when present. Um, what's the difference between a threat and a promise? <laughs> yeah, the action behind it. Okay. Um, you might not make good on the threat. On the promise, you're held to it. He says, I will do this when I'm with you, if necessary. Um, so... And then in the last uh, verse there, verse 12, he's uh, comparisons again. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. I think he's talking di directly about those people in Corinth at the time that are patting themselves on the back to undermine Paul. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. Just, they are, they're just flat out ignorant. So comparing yourself among brethren, comparing ourselves among brethren, he calls it foolish. 
is what he really says. He says, uh, uh, it's without understanding if the point is to commend ourselves at the, and build ourselves up at the expense of somebody else, it's a, it's a foolish exercise. Do not, do not do that. Recognize, and he says this uh, in, like in Ephesians 5, is that where he talks about uh, different talents? We're all given different gifts. Okay. Okay. God gives different people different talents. Okay. And whatever talent that is, you should not be commending yourself for it. What? Um, and he's not co uh, comparing. He's going to go into this comparison thing. He's kind of setting them up here for it right now. He's not comparing himself or commending himself in comparison to others in order to tear those other people down. Okay. He's, that's what they were doing to him. And so he's going to get into this thing when we get there into chapter 11 where he says, okay, I'm going to boast. It's foolish, but I'm going to boast. And we'll talk more about that as we get there. But to the extent that he is having to commend himself, he does it so that he can build them up and not tear them down. Pretty clear? Any other points there in what we do, 7 through 12? Okay. 13 through 18. But we will not boast beyond limits, but we'll boast only with regard to the influence God assigned to us to reach even you. For we are not ex overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. There's a reference to Paul really founding that congregation there. We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may not be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another area of influence. But the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Okay. So this, this, he gets into the realm of proper boasting. And I, as I read through this, I, I, I find this whole thing kind of just a difficult passage to figure out exactly where he's, where he's talking about and everything else. Where was Paul sent? As we start this discussion, where was Paul sent? In the broad scope of things. Turn over to Galatians. Yeah, yeah. Turn over to Galatians 2. Galatians 2, verses 7 and 8. Um, there's context there, and you can go back. I think you're familiar enough with this that uh, chapter 2, verse 7, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted, and that they is the 12 that are back in Jerusalem that he's met with, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. You know, here's Paul getting into his comments and everything else. It's kind of run-on sentences. So they, the original 12 recognized that hey, Paul being sent to the uncircumcised, Peter to the circumcised, even though who started off with the uncircumcised? Peter did. Okay. Um, and that would be Acts 10. Cornelius, right? Acts 10. Yeah. Okay. So Paul is being sent to the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, okay, the foreigners. And... Um, so it, he's saying, I'm not going to boast beyond limits, boast with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us, which is to the Gentiles, even to you. Um, is he focusing, as he talks about this in this area, is he talking about all the work he's done in Earth, or the work that he's done in Corinth? He's talking about the work that he's done in Corinth among them. Is he boasting of any other men because of his impact on them? He's not boasting about that either, okay? He is trying to increase his influence in Corinth. Okay? He's trying to make the point to them that, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, you need to listen to what I'm saying because I've got the truth, and, and you, need to, you need to trust me and understand. Catch up on my slides. God sent me. I'm fulfilling that role. Right. God sent me. Right. And, and that's recognized by God because God gave him the ability to do the signs of an apostle. And that's over in chapter 12, and we'll hit it again. Uh, 
but he's also recognizing that even the other apostles, right. okay, have endorsed me in this regard. So, okay. so he's not really boasting of the impact that he's had on other men outside of court either. Right. At this point, you know, chapter eleven, he kind of gets into that when he, when he gets into this uh, this other thing about foolish boasting. So he is trying to influence the, the people in court. And the point of that is that if he can build up court to where they ought to be, what does that allow him to do? Go on somewhere else, right? move on to somewhere else. Uh, turn over in Acts chapter 15. Fifteen, twenty, and twenty-one. Is that it? That's not it. Why do I have that? I looked all these up. It's seventeen. No, uh, I don't know what chapter it is. Somewhere it's verse twenty and twenty-one. <laughs> but it. Uh, <laughs> Same verses there. It's not the verses I was looking for. The point I'm trying to make, and you, you'll recognize this verse. He says he, he prefers to preach where nobody else had done so. Okay? And that's what brought him to Corinth. Is it Romans 15? Maybe. Is that so I have made my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named. There you go. Yeah. Lest I should build on another man's foundation. Yeah, that's it. So Romans 15, 20 and 21. Thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have, been, have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. So Romans 15, 20, 21. And then on, in, uh, down a couple of verses, in 24 and 28, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. He's speaking to the Romans here, but he's talking about his intent. He wants to go to Spain. He's been to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. In 28. When therefore I've completed this and have delivered to them what has been collectively for Spain by way of you. Okay, so there's a couple instances there of things that he wants to do after he's done with Corinth and done with Rome. We'll move on to Spain and work over there. Um, in, back in 2 Corinthians 10, verses uh, 17 and 18. He talks about, if you want to boast, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Turn over to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 9. Verse 23 and 24. This is about boasting also. And the same... Uh, same perspective, same inspirer that wrote both of these, right? He's both from the same God. This says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, the Lord is saying this, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. So if you feel the need to boast, boast about God. Okay? That's where we, we ought to be boasting about, about God. Look what God's done for us. Look what God done, has done all through time to make his plan come into effect. That's that's what I would call safe boasting. I don't know if Paul uses that, but let the, the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Okay. Any other? I don't have anything else on chapter 10. Move on. Chapter 11. This is where Paul really starts hammering the false apostles, getting very, very direct. Let's read. Uh, let's read 1 through 6. I wish you would bear with me a little foolishness. And he's going to, he uses this in, in 11, he uses it in uh, 16. Uh, Talks about boasting uh, at 11.30, 12.1. Uh, 
So uh, in, in uh, 12, 11, I've been a fool. And he's going to say this several times through this whole passage. Look, it's foolish to reason this way. It's foolish to reason this way. It's foolish to reason this way. The whole point of what he's making is that, look, you have driven me to this. You've accepted those who are being foolish. You've accepted them by their standard. Let's be foolish and use that standard. And now I'm ahead of all of them if we use that standard. But it's foolish to reason that way. And that's what he's saying over and over again. So keep that in the back of your mind as we go through both of these chapters. So uh, I've got down, he takes a comprehensive tour of his argument against those in Corinth that were working against him and perverting the gospel of Christ. So chapter 11, 1 through 6, I wish you would bear with me a little foolishness. Do bear with me. For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles, even if I'm unskilled in speaking, I'm not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. So again, he starts off with, bear with me a little foolishness. Um, some of the Corinthians have been misled by these, these people who came from the outside that were visitors. And, and this passage starts to remind, remind us of where else in Paul's letters. Different topic, maybe, but who? Where else does he write something along these lines about somebody else coming in from the outside? Galatians. Galatians. Yeah. You foolish Galatians. Okay, you've listened to these people from the outside and, and accepted something completely different. They've been happy to do it. Okay. He's dealing with the same thing here in Corinth. Different topic, same problem, though. Okay, not putting up... Uh, too easily putting it up with a false gospel. Okay, that's probably the best way, to, best way to say it. And Paul is going to expose these people by using their own boasting against them. And because in whatever way they could boast, he could boast even more, even though it was a foolish way to go. And, um, and again, like I said a few minutes ago, the signs of a true apostle in chapter 12, Paul had those, they did not. And this is what he... Kind of kept pointing to Lee. Um, here, you said earlier, there are some who are deceiving others, and there are some who are being deceived. And you also said that he is harsher with those who are deceiving than those who are being deceived. But I think he is talking more directly to those being deceived. Right now. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Yeah. Okay, um, okay. I, I, I wanted, I'm just thinking, according to Galatians, out that there are other Christians who are doing the very same thing as these who are deceiving. But still speaking to the deceived. Right. Yeah. And there's, there's, you can't separate the two, the deceiver and the, the, those who are tempted to be deceived. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which is the beginning of the usage of the spiritual gifts, he, he sets them up. Chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now this is the gentle one. Okay, 1 Corinthians 12. Yeah. Okay. Concerning spiritual yep. gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pregnant, you were led astray. And the whole idea is they're all confused about spiritual gifts. And he says, you have a habit. You have a history of falling prey to things that are deceptive. And the same thing is happening in 1 Corinthians. The same thing is happening in 2 Corinthians with those who are being deceived. They're falling prey to it. And so those who are falling prey to it, he is gentle with them. Right. Those who are the prey, prayers, the prayers, he is not gentle. Yeah, predator, I think, is the yeah, real word for that. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, just interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because I think I, I think he sees hope for the one. Right. Probably not the other. Because the others are, I, I think they know that they're wrong yeah. and yeah. do it anyway. So. Um. Yesterday, I was having a study with a young Christian who, at the, the last question he asked me, setting up for next week's study, was, how do we deal with 
those who hold to error? How do we how do we Bible study with those who are in error? Um, and the point is, nothing changed. You know, it depends on who they are, what their motive is, if we can tell, things yeah. like that. Yeah. But so we can read, oh, I'm sorry to go on. When I was down talking with Greg Duggan, my father-in-law, uh, who's a preacher, we were talking about this book. And basically we're saying it's really a manual on how to deal with people who are in error and whether or not they are intentionally in error or just being deceived. Right. And, and those are kind of the two categories, aren't they? And how do you deal with the one? Are, are, are you going to be able to really deal with the one? Now, in, uh, in, uh, back in Acts, when uh, it is a Peter that deals with Simon the sorcerer, or Phil, you know the situation we're talking about, right? Okay, so Peter's dealing with Simon the sorcerer and saying, hey, I'll give you money if you give me that power, right? Okay, now, He's pretty harsh <laughs> in response, okay? If Simon had not been at least honest in his approach to things, now, he was completely wrong, but he was coming from a pretty bad place, too, okay? If Simon had, had instead of accepting Peter's challenge, he, you know, he, I think he accepts Peter's challenge, that, hey, pray for me that this doesn't happen. Well, that's a pretty honest reply. He's got, I think, a good heart for eventually doing the right thing. If he had responded, who do you think you are? Okay, now we've got a different matter here. Now we've got a different matter. And now it's maybe time for strike Elimus blind, right. a kind of a situation where people would be very direct, hey, this is the authority I've got, and, you know, and deal with him that way. But he deals with him two different ways because it's obvious his heart is at least ten toward the right place. So there's the motivation of the person who is uh, committing the error or teaching others error and trying to figure that out. Right. It's the heart of the predator. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We can't read into their hearts. Paul likely knew more than we, you know. Right. He's going to preach to them and say this, in a sense, the same as he would to those who may be seen yeah. to maybe persuade them back to him. Right. Right. So you've got the predator over here, and you're going to deal with him in one way, and you've got the prey over here. What is he lacking? Well, knowledge and wisdom would be kind of the two things that I'm, I'm looking at there. He, he doesn't know. He just doesn't know. And so you have to explain that to him. Just like, you know, when our children don't know something, and they come, I don't understand what you mean. Okay, well, let me explain it to you. So... The predator may not know to a certain degree as well. And so there's a time for patience, especially, you know, we, we can't speak with the authority and the knowledge of Paul or Jesus when they deal with these things right. at all. Right. And so we have to use reason, right. okay, and patience. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and at some point it becomes clear that we're throwing our pearls before swine, okay? And... And that's, that's up to our wisdom to, to decide what that's going to be. Yeah. Too often, you're exactly right, we have to be patient. If we don't have the wisdom of Paul, we don't have the insight of Peter and all that, which is obviously true. At the same time, and so very often I hear people run with that. And the, if the, the unnecessary conclusion they come up with, then we just can't do anything. Yeah. But Paul, who is inspired, writes in Romans 16, you, therefore, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. Right. So you don't have to be inspired to. It might take you longer, but you don't have to be inspired to. Right. And in the end, and you, you said this years and years ago, in, in deciding when to do some of these things, particularly when it comes to the matter of fellowship in the congregation, we might be wrong. We might accept somebody in that we should not have accepted. We might reject somebody who we should have accepted, and we just have to make our best efforts and, and be patient in going, going through this. So, uh, so I, I think the, uh, the the pearls before swine thing that he says it really cuts to the heart. At what point do you decide that you're you're, you're casting your pearls 
the wisdom of God before people who have no willingness to accept it. And when you have gotten to that point, it's okay to walk away from it. Okay? Now, if you haven't even tried and you're walking away from it, that's another matter. Okay? But there's a, there's a point where you walk away from it. And perhaps the pearls that you have cast up to that point will become a seed that a week, a month, a year, or a lifetime later, it bears fruit somehow. And that's and that's all you can do. So, um, is it, Janice, is it okay to tell a little bit of story about Doris and Elmer? Okay. Janice's brother Elmer, who is I don't know, ten years older than you, something like that, and his. Doris was here. He's a hoof trimmer. A, a huge cattle operation that has like a hundred thousand <laughs> cattle. Okay, okay. Um, part of the idea of going down there was to start a Mennonite community, also. In the meantime, there was nothing there other than one little church of Christ, okay. and that's born fruit. So, and after a period of time, he was convinced he needed to be baptized and was. And she was telling him, you know, kind of, I'm, I'm gonna. Put a whole bunch of things together. You're crazy. We don't do that. Okay. And eventually she got to think of it. And now they've both been baptized. Okay. Now, who knew who in the process there was a Christian who had an influence on them knew when that was going to happen? Or what it was going to be. No. No. That's that's God planting seed. Okay. And having it come to fruit. Because they met a group of Christians who were patient with them and loving with them kind with them and it, it's more fruit. So they kept going. Yeah. Yep. yeah. People ask, why don't these people? Yeah. They don't keep coming. Yeah. Fellowship takes care of itself. Yeah. yeah. So um, so that, that's what we're about. So well, that's what we're supposed to be about. How's that? That's what we're supposed to be about. Could I have a clarification? Okay. I want yeah. to check on and it's sort of it's not off Topic, but it's it's shifting gears from what we've been discussing <clears throat> actually. Um, Second Corinthians eleven. I wish you would bear with me a little foolishness to bear with me. And your suggestion is what he's saying here, but to to perhaps rephrase him. I'm going to Paul is saying I'm going to go ahead and follow a fallacious line of reasoning for a moment itself. Y yes. Okay. Okay, so hang out of that thought for a minute. And I'm only bringing this up because it took me forever to find the passage. I've been sitting here for 10 minutes looking at yeah. Gary, when we were in 1 Corinthians, I'm thinking it was 15. It was, let me look it up here. We had an interesting conversation about, so what I'm going for here is this, this observation I want to make is about the, the, the types of arguments that Paul was willing to use. That's what I'm paying attention to here. Um, second half of the chapter about baptism how the resurrection of the body verse 35 is this what we were talking about I'm asking now someone will ask how are the dead raised what kind of body do they come you foolish person you so did not come left okay now wait a minute that's the wrong spot 29 29 you were probably coming to you other there it is 29 otherwise what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead and then he goes and says some more stuff now, do you remember here we were talking about this? And one suggestion was he was going ahead and using a bad argument to make his point. And he was sort of admitting that, but it wasn't clear enough to us. That's why the conversation was happening. Do you remember? I, I, you, I do you remember, remember the discussion. You do remember the discussion. Yeah, so, you, 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 it, it, was, it wasn't necessarily controversial, but we were at a point where Gary thought that he wasn't necessarily using a bad argument, and, and Jonathan and at least I were understanding the possibility that he was using a fallacious argument temporarily to make a point. And, and I'm just suggesting that perhaps that would still be the case, considering that Paul appears to be doing that also in 2 Corinthians 11, that it is a process that he does utilize at times. I'm just making that a suggestion or trying to tell him that's all. That's all. I'm not, I'm not saying approved anything, but I'm just saying, hey, maybe it does happen. Well, I, yeah, go ahead, Lee. I, I don't disagree with uh, what uh, 
George is saying, other than the only time we know he did it, we know he did it because he told us. Yeah, that's true. I, I do not deny that. Yeah, I do that would be my that. argument for First Corinthians 15. <laughs> right. Yeah. He, he, he does say he's doing it. We were trying to understand 1 Corinthians 15, 29, and one of the suggestions was, well, maybe he's picking up on something like, well, these people do this and it's ridiculous, but, and okay, so he doesn't say but there, but. But in, in, in this chapter section, he, he explains great deal. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I know. I know. But at the time when we discussed that, I said, well, there's another time where he where he does go ahead and, and jump onto a fallacious line of reasoning for a moment. And he admits it, but I couldn't think of where I could think of where that now here was. And I've spent ten minutes trying to go back and figure out how to come up. But. Okay, uh, let's see. We are back in eleven. Okay, divine jealousy. This in uh, in, in the early part there. I feel a, for I feel a divine jealousy, divine godly jealousy for you. Okay? Since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ, okay? He, Paul had been there and arranged the marriage. A, it is what he's saying. It's a and, first that I'm like a father. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, you know, he, he's arranged the marriage and he wants to see it work out. Yeah. Okay. And so that's why he's still in there helping him, helping him, helping him, correcting him when they need correction because he wants to see this, this thing work out to him. But he's concerned. That they were being deceived, the way the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Someone proclaim, comes and proclaims another Jesus, you you accept it. You know, hey, whatever. What's the, you know, what's the last argument I heard in the last three minutes kind of thing? Okay, now it's another three minutes going on. Somebody's arguing some help. Oh, yeah, I'm with him. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm with him. Uh, with him. Paul's saying, you know, you're not, you're, you're getting away from what the truth is, you need to stick with the different things. And so he's concerned that they have accepted a different Jesus than because they have they've been taught by somebody who teaching error about something that wasn't true about Jesus. Well, if you teach falsehood about Jesus and convert somebody to that falsehood, they're not following the real Jesus, they're following a the false Jesus. Okay. Look at the denominations in the world. Yeah, there is nothing new under the sun. Yeah, there is nothing new under the sun. I, I mean been going on for 2,000 years now. But look at what some of the other the others teach about Jesus. Salvation by faith only is the biggest thing going on. Some of the things are just unrecognizable. Unrecognizable. So, uh, a different gospel. Okay. I was talking to somebody in this room not too long ago, a visitor, and it was something about uh, um, Real Israel, old Israel. You know, it was, it just got so weird. I just don't even want to, you know, it's like, what? I mean, did I just hear that? There's some ideas out there that you can find anything on the internet. So, okay, so a different, a different gospel, a different spirit, all of those things. And these things all exist out there. How is it that they exist? Why are they still out there? My people, what? Are lost for a lack of knowledge. Okay? A lack of knowledge. What's the, what's the beginning of knowledge? Fear of the Lord. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's a lack of knowledge that brings these things about. And so. You, you, you might go to a place and well, they got great entertainment, but false ideas. You're there for the entertainment, but the false ideas work their way in. Okay. Uh, but that thing—that's uh, that's how they exist. Um, they're ready to accept it. And here's first in First Corinthians chapter three. He starts way back then dealing with this a little bit. Just read chapter. Uh, chapter 3, verse 2. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you're not ready. Okay? Milk, not solid food. Turn to Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews basically says the same things, which would lead a number of 
people to believe that Paul also wrote Hebrews. Okay. But the same same sort of thing in Hebrews 5, verses 12 and 13. For by though for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he's a child. Solid foods for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Where do you want to be in that <laughs> description? Okay. We should be at the end of that in that description. That's where we ought to be. And that takes constant practice. Where you get the constant yeah. practice? Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Man, man has a tendency to do what? Wander in any yeah. direction there yeah. is. Because it's not in a man to correct the steps. Get back. Yeah. Right Constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So we need to be asking our question, ourselves those questions. Is this the right or the wrong thing to do? Maybe the most common words in our raising of our voice. Is that the right thing or the wrong thing? I, I think I've said this before very early. They caught on that whenever I asked that question, it was because we wanted to point out the wrong thing. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if they even looked at it anymore. It's now the wrong thing. It took a while for me to catch up and start asking when I saw somebody do something good. Is that the right thing or the wrong thing? See the gears turn. Well, it seems like the right thing, but the answer is always the wrong thing. <laughs> That's when I think the real teaching started to finally happen. So, back to 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, he talks about the reason that they still needed milk. You are still flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, you are not of the flesh, saving uh, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, another I follow Paul's, so are you not merely be or being merely human? So it was jealousy, the jealousy and strife amongst themselves, okay, that kept them from maturing, and that's why they still needed milk, okay, and could not move beyond that to uh, the pure food. Okay, back in 2 Corinthians now. Chapter 11. Um, th this next section has to do with the super apostles, what my translation calls the super apostles. So I'm going to quit <laughs> uh, because there's a there's kind of an extensive. Uh, I, I don't want to get into this big idea in three minutes. So let us stop right there. Close enough. We'll just uh, break. And it up in time on the hour for us. Thank you.